Hey guys, this is Shannon with Tweaktown, and today we're taking a look at the Super Micro C9 Z490 PGW board, and we're going to be doing a quick overclocking guide on this. Now one thing to note, this overclocking guide will apply to the C9 Z490 PG and PGW, as both boards are aesthetically, mechanically all the same. The only difference is whether or not they come with Wi-Fi pre-installed or Wi-Fi enabled, let's say. So let's go ahead and jump right in. The first thing you're going to get in the BIOS, obviously, when you start the board, you're going to have to spam the delete key on your keyboard, get into the UEFI or the BIOS like you see here. Um, Supermicro has made some pretty big improvements to make their BIOS much more friendly, which is a very welcome thing, especially in my opinion, because sometimes, especially in the early days when Supermicro got into the gamer boards, they... Their BIOS was much more server-like because, for those of you not aware, Supermicro is one of the industry leaders as far as uh, high-end servers, data center products, things like that. So their expertise comes from like maximum stability, um, high-end component choice, things like that, all made for sitting in a data center, burning at 100% load 24/7 for years before you know, before you hit your MTBF and basically you're swapping those out anyway. But that's not what we're working on today. We're working on something that is a gamer slash enthusiast specific product, which is their Z490 line. And with that, we're gonna take a look first at our easy mode screen. This thing is nice. It is uh, usable. There's not a lot of options here. This is for the most basic setup. If you're just worried about setting XMP and then gaming and calling it a day, you can get it all done here. However, if you're looking to tweak, overclock, things like that, you're going to want to get in the advanced section, which is where we're going to jump into now. But first, I want to take a look at what they do have here. There are CPU profiles. I'm not even going to toggle through them. You can see the leaf here. This guy is going to be, let's see, we got a leaf right there to the left. If I was to click left, it would put it into an energy efficient mode where basically the CPU doesn't turbo as much. It doesn't do any of the things you would normally expect it to do with its stock default setting. So that would just help it be a more power efficient system. On a 10900K, that would be kind of a silly thing to set unless you're just really, really trying to save power, which at that point I'd probably get a much more low end chip as well. But I digress. When you get to the uh, side over here, there's also a performance one, which basically jacks things up a little bit, makes it, makes it a little more performance focused, but also will kick the fans up to a 100% profile or max speed. So not really good for the everyday uh, gaming system, unless you're okay with that, or your fans just happen to be 100% loading not loud, which that would be impressive, but hey, you know what? Everyone's got a different system. We're going to work within the default profile. I'll also show you where you can select the CPU profile in the advanced menu um, here when we get into that. The other thing is obviously your DIMM information. We've got two 8 gig uh, G scale sticks, which are G scale Royals, 3600 megahertz. So You'll see our stock V-Core is right between 1.000 to 1.008 or 1,008 millivolts. Um, there's not a whole lot else besides that. We can set our XMP profile here if we just wanted to set that and then walk away and basically be done. But otherwise, you can also adjust your boot priority. That's about, and obviously select time and date. And maybe like your, you could set your language up here. A high DPI mouse was not a good choice for doing this in the BIOS, but that's okay. So now we're going to go ahead, we're going to tap the F7 key, which as you can see down here at the bottom, will take us to our advanced mode. Now if you ever are in a BIOS, and this applies to most every motherboard I've ever used, if you press F1, you'll actually get a general help screen, which will help you if you're not sure which key to do a specific task. A lot of time it will be listed in here. So we're going to go into F7, and you'll see your main BIOS info screen. You'll see our BIOS version we're on, all that good stuff, along with CPU information. Once again, you could set your time. You could set your system language. If you wanted to, there is a setting right here where you can set it so that it defaults into advanced mode if you don't care for that easy mode and you're always going to be using advanced. And while we're in here, you'll notice there is tons of things. I'm not going to take you through all these menus, but you can configure most of the things under advanced here to enable disable onboard uh, devices, everything from your super IO config to uh, your storage config, setting HCI RAID, what have you can all be done through here along with setting your default graphics device. Now, one thing I would say is pretty important is graphics configuration. I would always recommend primary display set it to uh, PEG, which is PCI Express, or uh, basically you want to set it there if you have an add-in graphics card. Because what that'll do is that'll ensure that your BIOS post screen shows on your 
um, external graphics card if you have an iGPU on your chip, which 10900K, the only ones that don't are like the KF variants or the F variant chips where the uh, iGPU is removed. So I always set that for PEG just because if I have a GPU in, right now I don't, I'm actually running off the iGPU to show you guys all this good stuff because I'm running into our capture card to show you everything we've got set up here. So with that said, you can also see we have hardware monitor where you can see all this good stuff. And if you scroll down, you've got your fan controls. This is another one. When you're setting things, you gotta have to remember that by default, your fan speed is set for quiet. Now they don't have like a performance one. They basically have quiet, stable, full speed, or customize. So I'm gonna set stable because I don't want quiet mode. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead. We're gonna go customize and let's see. Temperature 120, wow, that's a, okay, that's a heck of a ramp, but so at 20, it'll be 20% fan. And at 100 degrees, it'll be 100% fan. I think for CPU fan, let's go, we're just gonna back that up a bit. We're gonna set that to, let's say 90, de 90 degrees, because we want a bit more of a steep ramp for that. And this is not something you have to do. I've actually already overclocked this board to play with it, to get familiar with it before I introduced you guys to it. Because last thing I wanna do is like an unboxing video and come here and be like, yeah, I know nothing about this board, but good luck. And you know, as a matter of fact, we're gonna trim this up because these fans are not loud. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter 35 as our minimum fan speed, just so that we have a little more edge on our thermals while we're overclocking. We're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna go ahead and leave it at 20 because if your CPU is under 20, you're, or at least in my house, you're subambient. So if it's under 20C, we've got a problem to begin with because you're gonna get some condensation really quickly. So 35, and then we're gonna take this guy down to 90. This will give us a bit more of a sharp ramp and that's okay because as long as your fans aren't crazy loud, if you've got like really loud, annoying fans, it might not be the best idea. I'm gonna switch from mouse control here just cause keyboard, old school overclocking days, keyboard tends to roll all here. So we got boot mode, obviously UFI, you can set it for dual or legacy. Uh, most people won't be running legacy nowadays, especially with like Windows 10. Windows 10 is a very happy UEFI OS. So it's not something you necessarily need to worry about. Um, unless you're running a much older, like an older OS and you're making it work on this for whatever reason, whether it be like extreme benchmarking, then you already know what you're doing. I'm not even gonna go through that because that will be a waste of pretty much all of your guys' time. Um, you also have all these settings under your save and exit menu. This allows you to save, discard changes, what have you. You can uh, load optimized defaults from here. You can also do that with the F5 button. And you might do that pretty often if you're tweaking and tuning and finding the limits of your chip. Um, you can also update the BIOS if needed. If you click this start update button, it won't just start updating, don't worry. It'll actually reboot you into a flashing mode for the board. And this can be important, especially because being a DIY product, being that you built this system, eventually you are gonna have to update the BIOS because they will make improvements, stability, uh, performance things as the BIOS engineers figure out like whether it be memory compatibility or what have you that would make this board better. Now, we're gonna go ahead and go into overclocking. This is where it's gonna get interesting because by default, you can see we have our standard B clock is 100, is 100 uh, megahertz. So that's your normal bus speed, your normal uh, B clock rate. Um, you shouldn't really have to adjust that. However, if you have a locked chip, you can sometimes gain a little, more, little bit more performance by bumping that, you know, bumping up to let's say uh, anywhere up 103, 105, even up to 107 depending, but you'll start to have devices sometimes drop out and you'll start to have weird stability issues. So. That's something your mileage may vary, something you can play with if you have a locked chip. We're strictly gonna be dealing with the 10900K today, which has an unlocked multiplier. So that's where the sync all core or all cores and all that stuff or per core overclocking. We're gonna be doing an all core overclock, but first I wanna take you through the settings that are available. So we also have memory. We're, out, we're gonna set a memory profile. However, one cool thing is, as, I'm not gonna set it yet because it'll change other settings that I wanna show you guys. So then you have all of this stuff. There is a setting here that's gonna be pretty important, which once we uh, set it up for the all-core of a clock, it will show up called uh, SVID. You do wanna disable that when you are doing uh, an all-core of a clock because otherwise your voltages can jump all over the place. It's, it's just not a fun way to deal with things. So definitely you're gonna to wanna to do that. But you'll notice almost everything here is auto. There's not gonna be a lot from the stock. It's just, it literally is tuned out of the box. You don't have to mess with it too awful much. Now let's go back up here, our advanced, oops, let's back out of that. 
and then you have for instance let's say cpu feature you'll see all this stuff you have like the only thing disabled here is your turbo boost max 3.0 for whatever reason along with turbo mode um, or I'm sorry, energy efficient turbo being disabled. Now you'll notice once we start to overclock, certain things of these will change. Like for instance, C states will be automatically disabled. And this is actually a good thing. It keeps you from having to go deal with it. So go ahead and go here and you'll see ring, all this stuff. We will be overclocking ring ratio as well. This is your non-core parts. So this is things like your memory controller, cache, some of the other things that are uh, tied to it. Stock is about 4,300 megahertz or 4.3 gigahertz. Um, we're probably going to push that around 4.7. Now, one thing to know is that when we do do an overclock, a uh, when we perform an all-core uh, all overclock, you can lose single-core speed because this chip, the 10900K, is designed to use TVB and boost up to 5.3 gigahertz by default. Now, if your chip can't do all-core 5.3, which ours is right on the edge of that, so we're going to be pushing more for a 5.2 clock, um, you will lose a little bit. You'll lose a few percent of performance on your single core because you're losing technically 100 megahertz when it does boost up to that. So that's something to keep in mind. That's why for some people who are just gaming builds, things like that, if you're running a 10900K, I actually tell them, you know what? Let the boost algorithms work for you. Unless you have a workload you are doing that will take advantage of an all core overclock at a much higher speed because um, basically normally when you're doing an all core heavy load, you'll be around 4.9 gigahertz, which isn't bad. It's actually quite good. But... If you're looking at pushing the max you can for an all-core load, something like you know video rendering, things like that, obviously that extra speed will net you a good performance boost. And that's something we all could definitely benefit from. But if you're just gaming and whatnot and doing things that are going to be lightly threaded, then that high-performance TVB, TVB is going to be more of an advantage than uh, an all-core of a clock, which will net you more heat and more power draw. So with that said, we're going to take a look at some of these voltages and what they mean. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to leave this default. You do have that stable and performance. You have basically some different profiles here. These will load some stuff in the back end. It'll like, for instance, if you set the performance mode, it will ramp the, it'll put the fans at max speed, just 100% across the board. And for a 24 seven system, which is the overclock, I'm going to try to get you guys showing you how to tune it in. This is something I don't necessarily think is a great idea to run 100% fans unless you, once again, unless you happen to have fans that are super quiet in your system and you're okay with that, then awesome. Cool, cool, you know, cool deal. You don't have to worry about it. But I want to keep it so that this is something that's a livable everyday gaming or productivity system that's not going to blast your eardrums with fan noise if you happen to be, let's say, using speakers or not wearing it, or not wearing like headphones. So we're going to do sync all cores. We're going to set 52. That's going to be 5.2 gigahertz across all cores, as you see here. You can see uh, core 0 through 9. So once I set core 0, since it's sync all cores. But let's say I wanted to go per core, I could actually set the individual per core like overclock if I had a core that was much stronger. But that's the type of level of tuning that you would definitely spend a lot more time on. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to set our XMP profile, which is 3600 megahertz. Now one cool thing that uh, Supermicro does is when you go in here, you'll notice you can't touch anything. But you can see how it's set. So if I wanted to, instead of wiping it like some boards do, you'll notice when I put custom profile, everything still stays here, including the settings it pulled from the, uh, from the uh, XMP profile. So your 16, 16, 36. Now you could go through your secondaries, your tertiaries, and everything that they offer in here. There are tons of settings, and you can start to get an idea of where you can start and start tweaking things. So that's a, uh, that's a plus. However, it doesn't have like a ton of different options there it's more um it's more just what it pulls raw from the uh, xmp profile so there are some that you would have to figure out if you want to get that deep into memory tuning however um for most people you're going to set xmp and you're going to walk away especially for like an everyday gaming system now llc load line calibration this is something that will help either bump up or basically stabilize the voltage because when you're overclocking you're pushing it well past what the stock you're pushing it past or adjusting it from the stock parameters including the boost algorithms so when you're setting like a fixed voltage like what we're going to do you're going to want to adjust that accordingly but what we're going to do is we're going to make sure now you see how this uh when i set the overclock the svid option did show up we're going to want to disable that right away because that's something you definitely want to do you don't want to deal with that now Let's see, we're gonna go ahead and go. Now core voltage, you do have options for adaptive or override. If you wanted like, uh, 
if you wanted an adaptive voltage so that it'll boost way down, if you're really trying to tune it for like the power savings, which is going to be marginal, but it's there, um, you could set it for um, over um, for not override, but for adaptive, and that will allow the voltage to go up or down accordingly. But I would much rather do override to know that we're having a nice solid voltage for it rather than something that's going to boost up or down. And depending on your response or a transient response or something like that, you could actually cause a system to lose stability when you transfer from no load to a really heavy load suddenly. That kind of stuff can end up kicking you. And that's not to say you can't tune it out with adaptive voltage. It just gets to be a lot more tricky and a lot more time tuning and stuff. You really got to figure out exactly how your platform works. So for this, we found that the load line, the LLC, the load line calibration on this board, if you left it disabled, which works, by the way, if I was to set my 1.32 V-Core, when you put it under load, it'll go to near 1.39 or so, which isn't really necessarily harmful for the chip, but it's going to give you a lot more power, a lot more voltage than you really need for this chip. So instead of undervolting and making up for it, I just set LLC for around four, which is about middle of the ground, or middle of the road, and you'll and you'll be able to, this is where I found the board is about as close to what you're setting. It'll slightly overvolt by about, let's say 10 to 12 millivolts, but that's far different than like a 50 to 60 millivolt jump, which is usually something I would prefer not to see. Um, you don't have to mess with VF, your VF curves, like your, uh, you, can, you can adjust this if you needed, but at the end of the day, that's far deeper tuning than you really want to deal with. Um, core voltage offset, we don't want to deal with that. We just go core voltage override. We're going to go ahead and set this for 1.32. Uh, let's go ahead and manually set the memory voltage as well. Also, you have your CPU IO and SA voltage. These, as you can see, are 0.96 and 1.05 accordingly, but you will notice that once you set your XMP profile, the SA voltage can jump up to like 1.35 or so, which is about the upper end, I would say, on like ambient cooling, I would really wanna push. You can go a little above that, but it, it starts to get the CPU pretty warm. It starts to really make things a little uncomfortable. We'll go ahead and we're, we're gonna leave them auto because the, with the XMP profile, it will bump these up. It'll bump the IO to around 1.1-ish, but it will bump the SA to 1.35. However, if you wanna tune this, you can actually knock it down to about 1. anywhere from 1.18 to 1.25, depending on your memory kit. And especially at like 3600, you're not pushing the memory controller that hard. You can usually get it stable with that without an issue. Save a little bit of that uh, voltage overhead. But you know what? Let's try to make this as simple as possible for an overclock. So, so far, all we've changed, just to recap here, we have, we left it default profile because, you know, why not? We're going to do sync all cores, 52. Now, we're going to go ahead and go back to XMP profile. Yep, let's not do that. Uh, we're going to have to go back to XMP profile just because we know it's everything's locked in. We're good. We're going to set LLC to 4. Obviously, core voltage mode is override. SVID is disabled. We're going to go ahead and 1.35 on our memory. I thought I had set that, but apparently I didn't. And now let's take a look here. Now, all this stuff should be the same. But one cool thing I want to show you is, like, like a lot of the high-end boards, like some of the boards we've tested all the way up to like 800 bucks, they tend to adjust things after the fact. Now you'll notice the TJ Maxx offset is now 10. You'll notice that if we go to like CPU feature, you'll notice some things now like speed shift. You've got this stuff still enabled, but you'll notice C states is now disabled. Otherwise everything else is pretty good. Now we're gonna want to, obviously it really depends on your CPU. This is another thing with, uh, with ring ratio. This is like I said before, this is your non-core parts. This is things like your IMC and your cache. So I'm pretty confident the CPU can pull off a stable 4.7. It could probably even do 4.8 rather well. 4.9 is a little iffy. Um, so we're gonna go 4.7 just cause we want something that's really good. Now ring down bin, we tend to disable that. And that basically will just allow it to stick at 4.7 and it won't, won't have to worry about any of that stuff playing with you. Now, we're going to go ahead. We're going to back out of there. What's cool is you um, this board does actually set a lot of settings once you start overclocking things. It will actually set a lot of things it knows. It has the logic in it. So it has logic built in that it knows like, hey, these things should be disabled like the C stage you saw. Which means you don't have to go around and tweak and tune nearly as much. Let's go check our hardware monitor since we tweaked so many things. Make sure our fan is, yeah, see, our fan adjusted because I was playing with the profiles. So that's not what you want. So we're going to go customize, PWM, 
Um, let's see. We're going to go. What did I do off that? I did. Okay. So I kept it. It just, it just had a different mode. So that's okay. 20, 35, 90. Okay. Let's go ahead and. I missed it. Nope. We don't want to quit without saving. All right. So we have all of our settings here that we should need. There's not a lot we really need to play with. The, some of these th settings you will notice. Like, for instance, when you go in your advanced voltage, a lot of these PLL and like reference voltages are not things you're going to have to touch unless you're pushing LN2 on this board, which Supermicro themselves actually did. This board has like second place at the time where, we're, where uh, I'm doing this video, which is the 2nd of July. They have like second place in the world on a 10900K when in reality they have first place on LN2 at 7,548 megahertz, a little above that. Uh, the only result that's higher than that is actually on liquid helium. So yeah, that's a lot of nope. We're not going to be doing that today either. We're not pushing for 7.5 gigahertz as much as fun it would be. That's a totally different video if we decide to do something like that. So this is going to be your, let's say your pushing the limit of our CPU because this is the one we can do. And most CPUs can do roughly around 5.1 to 5.3 on varying voltages between 1.35 to 1.4. We're lucky, as you can see, our, our chip will actually do 1.32 actual voltage, which is not bad. It's actually quite a good chip for a 5.2 uh, multi-core of a clock. However, you do have to keep in mind that a 10-core chip in such a small package means that it has a lot of thermal dumps. So you're gonna, it's gonna be toasty. Um, they did help with a thinner s but you still have a lot, a lot of thermals that are just being dumped into your cooling, whether it's a, whether it's liquid cooling loop or an air cooler, obviously you're gonna have to adjust voltages and expected frequency accordingly. If you're running something like a cheaper Hyper 212, you're probably not gonna be pushing this far. It's just, it's just the reality of life. There's only so much a cooling system can handle. We're actually on a 360 radiator here from AlphaCool, so this should handle it quite well. This is the same uh, test bench we use for all of my motherboard reviews and CPU reviews. So I'm very well aware of what this chip can do, and I know that the best we've had on it was right around 1.318 on the MSI Godlike Z490. This board seems to do it just about the exact same voltage, which is excellent, especially being that this board costs like a third of the cost almost, or like, let's say, 40% of the cost of what the boards like the Godlike, the Maximus Extreme, and the uh, Oris Extreme. This board costs much less, and from what I've seen, can do the same thing. So... Let's go ahead, we're gonna jump out of BIOS here. We're gonna F10 to save and exit setup. You can also go to the menu option for it, but let's go ahead and get out of this thing and we're gonna give it a shot and see exactly how fast we can get it to go. Now, one thing to remember on this is that the board, uh, it, is, it is based from a server company, so it will have slight eccentricities you may not be used to hearing. Like for instance, it's post beep style is much different than the standard single beep you hear from a lot of boards. It actually has a, uh, I've worked with super micro boards for well over a decade and I got really used to this post beep. So it's interesting to hear that since I'm used to testing recently consumer boards and to hear this thing do its post beep, which you should hear in a second, it's doing a few reboots as it trains the memory and sets all the massive amount of settings we just configured within the BIOS. Now, mind you, that I did actually set a uh, custom fan profile for this, but being that the test bench is about three feet away from my mic, you'll be able to hear if the fans are really high, and you'll notice that they do not with the way I have it set up. Had I set that performance profile, there you go, you hear that pop, 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 beep. That is a Telltale Super Micro post beep. Now, that means everything booted, everything's good, but that doesn't mean that system's 100% stable. We'll test that with something like a Cinebench R15, Cinebench R20 run. First we'll do Cinebench R15, which is non-AVX. Then we'll do Cinebench R20, which hits the CPU much harder. And we'll see exactly uh, how stable this is and if it runs well. We'll also take a look at like thermals so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about because this is on a 360 radiator. So you would think, you know, that's a ton of cooling horsepower. However, there is some, uh, there is some concessions with this because of the thermal density of the package we're working with. So, first things first, now that we're in Windows 10, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull up CPU-Z here. And as you can see, we're idling 131 to 132, and I've actually uh, confirmed this with the DMM that this is correct. 
4.7 Northbridge frequency, 1800, 16, 16, 16, 6. This all stuff is what we would expect. Got all everything as you would expect. There's your Super Micro C9 Z490 PGW. So you can see this is what we're working with. We got 5.2 gigahertz. Now we're going to first pull up Cinebench R15. Move it out of the way. And we're going to go ahead and engage a multi-core test here. And now you could slightly, I'm not sure if you can hear that. It's pretty close to the mic, but the fans kicked up on the radiator a little bit because obviously, you know, we're dumping some decent amount of heat to keep a 5.2 overclock pushing all cores at 20 threads. Now, 2795, just to give you some perspective, let me see, hopefully the result is actually saved here because we had just run a few minutes ago, 2659, as we were tuning this thing in. Ah, oh, you know what? I think it might have gotten rid of the old original score. The original score for Cinebench R15 for a stock 10900K is right around 2340 or so. It varies depending on runs. So we see we've got a stable enough. I mean, it runs Cinebench, so that's a pretty good, pretty good result. Now we're going to hit it with something that has a little more umph to it, uh, something like an AVX load, where we're going to go ahead and kick off R20 here. And you'll notice that now... The voltage is like, okay, we're still good with this, but you'll start to hear the fan will cr crunch a little bit more. It'll start to kick up a bit, and that's because it's really hitting this thing pretty hard. But at the end of the day, it's a good sign that this thing will run 100%. I'm not going to run one of the long, long, long renders tests. I normally run for motherboard testing because that would make for like a two-hour video, and that's not really a good solution. The biggest thing here is to show we've got some good stability and that this can run things like gaming or like, for instance, rendering that image like we're doing right now. Being able to render out with like an AVX load is definitely a plus and tells you that you're definitely more than stable for something like gaming. Because if you can survive AVX load tests, then that's a good sign. However, if you're going to test this, now 6777, this falls right in line with the overclocks I did on the other high-end boards I mentioned earlier. So that means this thing is performing exactly as you would expect. It's actually slightly higher because I tweaked the Uncore or the... Uh, I should say the ring slash encore, whatever, whatever name you want to give it is right around 4,700. You have a slight clock modulation, as you'll see. Um, it adjusts because basically you have a slight amount of float in your B clock. That happens. It's nothing bad. It's just the reality of life, especially when you start pushing over clocks. Um, you get slight variance in clock. So that's why you see the clock jumping from your 1799, which is uh, double pumped for DDR. So basically your 3,600 megahertz memory. So as you can see, this thing runs perfectly fine. It runs really good. Um, I'm quite surprised, to be honest, to see, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm quite surprised, to be honest, to see someone like Super Micro, who, once again, specializes in server boards. You know, really good quality, really good overall longevity, so really good component choice, but a board that is far more stripped down and far more basic for just get the job done style scenarios is able to push an overclock with a few settings like I just did the same way that some of these enthusiasts and, you know, XOC boards would, uh, would deliver. Now, another thing they have is they actually have their, uh, what's called super O booster, I believe software. And yeah, super O booster. This is a really cool interface. And the reason I like this so much is super micro basically worked with Intel did like a skin on their XT utility for you. For those of you not familiar with that, it's a very, very powerful tuning utility. It can, it can talk directly to the UEFI. You can do everything from BIOS update. Um, you can do CPU memory. Ther you can adjust thermal, uh, thermal controls. You can adjust voltages, including your, like, uh, you could, you could do this all on the fly and live while you're working. No, we don't want to, no, we don't want to do that. No, let's not do that either. Um, so when you're setting this, you can even do this within Windows. And this is actually, the, by using XTU, Supermicro got a major leg up on some of the other vendors who make their own software. While I respect the fact they make their own software, this is a Intel tool that tends to work quite well. And so I think that Supermicro made a quite brilliant decision deciding to go with this because it is something that will allow you to adjust. For instance, you can go like, let's say we wanted to drop down, you tack the top one. If you wanted to take everything up, 5.2, 5.3, as you can see, I'm not going to apply that because the system would likely become very unstable. But 5.2, you can adjust it all. You literally just apply, and you'll see a apply to BIOS setting. So when you apply that, it applies through the UEFI, 
so that you could technically make BIOS level adjustments right here without having to enter the BIOS, which is also another plus for those who maybe don't feel so comfortable in the BIOS. Just be careful because if you set it incorrectly, you might have to go back and uh, clear the CMOS to get the thing running. So with that being said, Supermicro built a quite capable board that has a much better UEFI than we have seen in the past from them. It's improving every chipset generation, which is a major plus. And I'm going to take us back in there and just take a look at a couple things just so you see exactly what we did, what we're doing. And uh, for instance, look at a couple of the enhancements they made in the BIOS before we cut this thing off. Now, do keep in mind that with the overclock we just did, we had no um, we had no AVX offset. We had a zero. So that means that it's running 5.2 AVX and non-AVX. And that's something I'm going to show you here next. That's probably one of the last things we'll cover in the BIOS is if you're going to tune something like this in, keep in mind that you can follow like our basic setup. I would recommend starting with like a 1.35 vCore setting um, just because that will help support far more chips. And you can always drop it by 5 to 10 millivolts at a time. I'll also have a written guide that this will be applied to as well, where you, um, it'll cover a little more granularly because it's not as easy to cover the stuff like that in a video. But whenever you look here, we're going to go, you'll see AVX2 ratio offset. Let's say your chip does 5.2, no problem, just like ours. But under AVX, it crashes. You enter 1.0. And that means it'll downbend by one, which means at AVX, it'll do 5.1 gigahertz. If that's not stable, you could try two or even three to take it to something like 4.9 gigahertz so that you still have your AV, you still have your gaming performance. It's not AVX at like 5.2, 5.2, but you would also have your, uh, you'd also have your AVX2 offset for when you're doing AVX2 workloads, like rendering videos or what have you. But for ours, we don't really need that. That's just, I mean, that's the magic of this is uh, these new Intel chips are very good and Supermicro has a very good supporting board to uh, show these features and to make it easy to overclock. So it is as simple as when you first load in the uh, OS or if you, when you first load in the BIOS, you can just set sync all cores, set it to like, let's say 5.2, set your XMP profile. LLC level four seems to be the best. You can adjust that or test with it, find what works best for you. And then obviously core voltage override, like we discussed, SVID disabled, and set your vCore. I would probably, since if you don't know your chip or don't know what its capabilities are, start that with 1.35. See if it's stable. I would stay below 1.4 or at 1.4 as a maximum on liquid cooling, just because otherwise you're going to start to get pretty toasty. Even with our 360 cooler at 5.2, at 1.32, you saw the voltage goes up to about 1.35-ish, almost 1.36. And at that voltage, you can hit mid, mid 80s or so under full load, especially under extended load. At when the loop saturates, you can get close to um, around 87, 88C. It's not going to hurt your chip. I know a lot of people are very apprehensive to go above 80, but it will not hurt anything. The silicon is designed to run at close to its thermal junction without an issue all the time if needed. But obviously keeping it cooler is better, means more stability. But with what we have right now with a 10 core in this kind of package, it's going to run warm. So that's something you've got to be prepared for. It's just the reality of life once again. Like if we look right here. We're sitting 34C, which is not bad idle. That's your socket temperature. It's not your actual CPU diode temperature. Diode temperature is going to be about 3 to 4C normally higher. So it's much higher than what we would see with a stock chip. And once again, not a bad thing. You just want to mind your temperatures while pushing these overclocks so that you know exactly what you're going to be able to do. Because pushing this overclock is great, but having it work well and last a long time is also just equally as important. So keep that in mind. Have fun overclocking. If you have questions on settings or if you have questions on something maybe I didn't mention that you wanted to talk about, uh, drop a comment down in the uh, down down below the video, and or even you know uh, contact us like on our uh, comments on the articles or what have you. And usually we'll be able to get back to you pretty quickly. And if it's something we know, otherwise we'll pull up some information and try to get you whatever we can. Uh, thanks for watching guys and I look forward for the next uh, OC video I can create for you guys showing how to tune and tweak your system to get the most performance possible. Have a good day.